Hello and welcome everybody, King Demps here bringing you a little recap of IEM Winter. Now, what I want to do in this video is just talk a little bit about some of the storylines that emerged in the first portion of IEM Winter. Obviously, we still have the semi-finals and the finals yet to come. However, I think there's a few interesting storylines and narratives that we can start to pick apart and take some information as we go into the end of the year. Now, one of the most popular topics of conversation at the moment in the Counter-Strike world is Gambit on LAN. Now, I understand where the narrative that Gambit are onliners has come from. They did experience a drop-off in form when compared to the start of the year, and that drop-off in form coincided roughly with Cologne happening on LAN earlier this year. It also coincided a little bit with the player break. Now, I want to break those down into kind of two separate elements. So yes, Gambit did experience a drop off at Cologne. They didn't play to their usual very high standard. However, it was their first major LAN. It was the first LAN in as long as anyone can remember. I think the only LAN that Gambit had played before that was some really tiny event in NA that happened like before an IEM. It had like crap teams. It was barely worth mentioning. So it's understandable that Gambit would have some jitters and would experience some issues on their first proper LAN on a huge stage with the biggest teams in the world. Now, the separate point to make is obviously the player break came just after that. And again, it's not surprising that Gambit, after a very busy start to the year, jam-packed with games, they were playing a huge amount of officials for a tier one team. One of the tier one teams that played like the most games. Obviously, after that, it's understandable they need to take a bit of a break. They need to reset a little bit. And it's understandable that they then come back and they're not quite the same team that they were. Now, I've actually brought up their event history so that we can have a little look at what they have played since Cologne. Obviously, ESL Pro League was the first event back from the player break, and it wasn't great for Gambit. They cruised through their group stage at that event, but then they immediately got banged out 2-0 by Vitality. Not great. Eliza Fall Invitational Fall 2021, they should be winning events like this. Again, not amazing. IEM Fall was obviously a lot better if we just open up that event page and we take a little look. Now, as we can see here, they actually placed very well. They won the whole event. They won the event ahead of Na'Vi, beating Na'Vi out in the grand final. And the CIS is a pretty stacked region, so it's impressive to win this event. However, got to remember that it was online. And if we look at PGL Major Stockholm, again, it's the first major for this lineup. Third to fourth is a good result. They got knocked out by the best team in the tournament, Na'Vi, the team that were always going to win that event. I don't care what anyone says, Na'Vi were going to win that event and no one was going to stop them. Admittedly, they didn't play anyone brilliant to get to the semi-final. They kind of had an easy draw. And then obviously, most recently, they won the V4 Future Sports Festival. The only other big teams in attendance really were Movistar Riders, Fiend, Big, and then obviously Entropic, who they played in the grand final, but they did win it. It was a LAN event and they did overcome some difficulties in the final. They were 2-0 up, got pegged back to 2-2 in order to win that trophy. Essentially, what I'm trying to say here is I understand where the narrative comes from that Gambit are onliners. Yes, they have not looked as dominant and as imperious on LAN, but we've got to remember this is a really young team. They only really have come up to the top of the scene in the last year and a half or so, and they hadn't played any lands in that time. They came up during the online period. Now that's not Gambit's fault. Like you can't fault them for the fact that they came up during the online period. It's just how the world worked at the time. But I think we do have to now start to examine Gambit a little bit more carefully when they're playing on land. They've got a few under their belts now. We need to see them start to improve and start to put together performances that convince us that they can get back to the time type of level they were at in the first half of the year. Now, looking at this run, it was pretty decent. Gambit got out of their group. They did lose, obviously, in the upper semi-final, 2-0 to Virtus Pro, but that was a pretty close series. Went to overtime in the first game, went all 30 in the second game. Honestly, Gambit, that series could have gone either way. Virtus Pro are looking really good in a little bit of a honeymoon phase, potentially, with Flit. And Flit seems to be fitting into the lineup really well. So I'm not going to lament Gambit that loss too much, especially because they bounce back. They beat FaZe in a difficult series. If we look again here, second game went to overtime and they had to overcome a lot of difficulties in that game. And even the first map that they lost was close. 
And then we look at Fnatic and a similar kind of story emerges. They have to reverse sweep. They win the second map in overtime, backs up against the wall, and then they absolutely spank them on the last map. Obviously, looking at their court finals, they once again fell to Vitality. Seems to be a little bit of a bogey team for Gambit. I'm not sure maybe if the Ziwoo factor is an issue, but again, they could have very easily won this series. It went to OT on Mirage, and Vitality, as their ranking dictates, they're the number two team in the world. They're one of the best teams right now. They reached the grand finals of Blast. No worries losing to them. So what do we think? feeling about gambit well the big con that i can see with gambit is that their map pool seems to have shrunk dramatically during the online period it basically looked like you couldn't go anywhere against gambit with the veto they were good on every single map except obviously their permaban there was nowhere you could go and get a favorable matchup you kind of just had to accept that you were going to play gambit on three maps that they were pretty fucking good at the problem is now Dust2 seems to become a real weakness for them. They dropped it to Fiend and Enterprise at V4 Future Sports. Fiend, maybe you can forgive. They've got some crazy aimers and Dust2 is that kind of map. But Enterprise, you should never be dropping a map to if you're Gambit, let alone getting pretty convincingly beaten on Dust2. And then at this event, they've dropped it to both VP and Vitality. Obviously much better teams, but it is showing that Dust2 is a little bit of a chink in that Gambit armor. They also suffered two close losses on Inferno here, and Inferno is dropping down to sort of like a 50% win rate for Gambit. It's looking like a map that you can go to and you can definitely beat them on. And Vertigo, which they were absolutely unbeatable on and had a crazy streak on from the start of the year, is now no longer a banker for them. They lost Vertigo to Vertus Pro here. They've lost Vertigo recently to other teams. It is no longer a banker for them, and that is a worry. Vertigo no longer being their home map is probably the biggest issue you can have inferno being a 50 50 map for you it's not the end of the world they're losing it to good teams and you can have dust 2 again being a bit of a wobbly map it's a wobbly map i think for most teams i don't really think it's a reliable home map just because of the way dust 2 is the way dust 2 plays but i do think the gambit map pool is suffering a little bit and that is the big con i see with them on land they're not the same team in terms of depth on the maps that they were during the online period now, the big pros, I think, for Gambit looking at them on LAN is Shiro seems to not be fussed by LAN. He's still an absolute monster, still playing like a top five player in the world, still clutches like nobody else in the game right now. Shiro is the best clutcher in the game right now, and you're wrong if you think otherwise. I'm sorry. I think that's an objective fact. But the big, big, big boon and something that they had really been suffering from in this sort of little mini slump, let's call it, since Cologne, is Axile's form. Axile seems to be recovering, not sheerly in terms of numbers. His numbers never dropped off a crazy amount during this little wobble, let's say, in Gambit. But what did drop off particularly was the type of plays he was making. Axile was really important to Gambit as an aggressive lurker, somebody who would use his innate game sense to make timing-based plays and punish the enemy team, usually, often, on his own. That's something that he seemed to be less willing to do particularly on land and particularly since the player break i'm not sure maybe if his confidence suffered a little bit and that's totally understandable he's a young player playing on a young team but now axile seems to be getting back to his old self he seems to be making more of those aggressive timing style lurk plays and i think that's really key to gambit's play style nafany normally is the aggressive space taker on one side of the map but they need axile to be ready to make those timing based plays based on what nafany does particularly on t side obviously i'm i'm mostly talking about t side here so what's the summary on that one gambit they're getting there but they've still got a bit to do now the next storyline that i think is particularly interesting and we can stay looking at this bracket to take a look at it is god sense run at this event Taco has done an incredible job at bringing together a group of young Brazilian players and molding them into a legitimate top 20 team who, who knows, maybe they could go on and start to press and challenge for a top 10 spot. This tournament, I don't think you can get too excited about, but it definitely shows that Godsent have got some potential. Being heroic, yes, only a best of one, but it's a very impressive feat. And I do think Heroic individually have kind of dropped off at the last couple of events. I'm not sure they're doing enough individually. That was kind of Heroic's boon is that all five players at different moments can pop off. And at the moment, they're really kind of struggling for like even two of them to kind of hit form at the same game, which is a bit of a problem. But 
I digress. I still think it's an impressive result for Godsend, especially considering the kind of gap in the pedigree between these two teams. They beat Big 2-1. The problem, I think, is here with kind of Godsend's tournament run at this event is that the only best of three they actually won was here against Big. And we've got to be honest, Big are not looking great at the moment. Big's biggest problem, Big's biggest, yep, I know, is that they just don't win enough duels. They don't have enough firepower. Gade, Keto, and Tizian all kind of generally sit at an, a sub-1 rating, which is what you see in this series here. Tabson's in-game leading, and although he probably has the firepower alongside Searson to be enough of a 1-2 combo that Big could do stuff even with Gade, Keto, and Tizian on the team, the fact that Tabson is in-game leading obviously takes away from his fragging ability. You can see it in-game. Ever since he's taken over leading the team, he doesn't hit the same heights with the same regularity. He's still a consistent fragger, don't get me wrong. He will still get his, but he's not going to be the star player that Big really need to kind of go over the top. So as much as it's impressive for Godsend to get a best of three win over Big, I think that kind of solidifies you as a top 20 team, but nothing more. And then the other two series they played, one against Virtus Pro, they ran them close on Mirage, fair play, got banged out on Dust 2. And then obviously they got beaten by Nip. It was relatively convincing on Nuke and Ancient, well done for taking over pass. But ultimately this run tells me they're a top 20 team and I'm reserving judgment to see more. The big thing that was super impressive about Godsend at this event was their stats. We'll take a look at that actually in a second. Now, the thing that was so impressive for me for Godsend was the fact that all of the players contributed in a big way to different games. Now, first off, we're going to see Lato and Taco. They performed very well in the match against Heroic, and they were the two that got their team over the line with the heavy lifting. But then, for example, we take a look at this map versus Big. Now, this was their victory on Mirage, the second map of the series. And it's Phelps and Dumal going absolutely ham. Two different players from what we saw in the first game. Now, we're taking a look at their map win versus NIP on Overpass. And it's Phelps and Barton who are doing the heavy lifting. Basically, depending on which game it was at this event, a different player seemed to go absolutely ham and contribute in a big way to the victory. And for me, that was something that was very impressive to see out of Godsent. And that was something that actually gave me a lot of hope for them going forward is the fact they don't seem to rely on one mega player. If anyone is going to be that mega player, it does kind of seem like it's going to be Phelps. He's the guy with the pedigree. He's the guy who we've seen in the past look like he could be a top 20 for sure player in the world. Maybe that's what he'll kind of be able to grow into for this team. We'll have to reserve judgment for now. But in summary, Godsense run at this tournament, I think shows for sure they're a top 20 team in the world and they can definitely hang at European events. I reserve judgment on how good exactly they are just yet, but this is definitely a good start. And I'm feeling positive about Godsense going forward. Now, in a similar vein, one of the other most interesting teams at this event and it's crazy that the most interesting teams kind of all came in the Group B of this event. Don't know why that is. It's just thought it was interesting. Are Fnatic. Now, Fnatic. I think we can start to expect big things potentially from Fnatic in the future. Now, why do I say this considering they actually kind of had a, a, a different run to Godsend? Fnatic didn't even make it out of the groups. Well, first off, I think Fnatic had a much harder run than Godsent. They had to play Gambit twice, and Gambit were, apart from Virtus Pro, the best team in this group. And Godsent also avoided FaZe and Heroic, who were the other two like really good teams in this group. So Godsent kind of avoided playing any of the great teams in best of threes. I know they beat Heroic in a best of one, but that's why I kind of put a little bit more stock in Fnatic's showing at this event over Godsense, and I'll explain exactly why. First off, Fnatic beat Big, which is something that Godsent did. Fnatic beat Ents, who are a pretty good team, and I would actually probably put them slightly above Big at the moment, Ents. I mean, their ranking in the world says that they are kind of a little bit better than Big, and I would back that up with the eye test. But also, Fnatic ran Gambit really close in this series apart from the last map. Now, I know they did get banged out on Overpass, but honestly, I think maybe mentally Fnatic struggled a little bit after that Vertigo game. And 
Smuya is definitely a player who historically you could probably suggest might be a bit of a tilter. Brolan seems a little bit quiet. I don't know necessarily if he's the kind of guy who's going to step up when the chips are down and is going to bring the team together. So potentially there can be some issues there around tilting after that Vertigo game. Wouldn't be too shocking. They're a new team. It's something potentially you can allow. It's one of those details that it's difficult to work on as a team until it kind of happens. But why was I so impressed with Fnatic's run? First off, Smuya, Brolan, Mezzi, and Crims all had their moments where they took over games or took over rounds or contributed in a big way in terms of plays and frags. That is something that makes Fnatic so dangerous and is a similar reason I was praising Godsend, but I think Fnatic have it to a slightly higher degree. Like They have insane amounts of individual skill on this roster, and that is going to be a threat to any top-tier team in any event that they play in. The other thing that I want to talk about with Fnatic and that I found particularly impressive was their T sides. I really liked the way Alex set the team up on the T side, Generally, the majority of the T-side was composed of relatively simple, relatively fast-paced rounds, which I think suit the skill-heavy nature of the team. I think that really suits them. And it also allows Crims to play on the other side of the map and play off of some of this fast-paced play that's going on with the other side of the map and allow him to make plays and have a lot of time to take space, create room, create lurks. And I really like that setup, kind of having a bit of a 4-1 with Crims on one side of the map, the rest on the other. I think that really suits the personnel on their team and it allows Crims to shine in the best way as a veteran on the T side. Obviously, it's not all one dimensional as well. They do throw in the slightly slower paced defaults just to switch it up because Alex is good enough of an in-game leader to know you can't have a completely one-dimensional and single look T side. You're just not going to get it done against the best teams in the world with that kind of approach. But it gave me a lot of faith that Fnatic are on the right path and I think they can get better moving forward with more time to develop. I'm really excited about this Fnatic roster. I think they will be a top 10 team in the world next year if they can stay on track, if they can keep this five together and if Issues behind the scenes don't cause any problems. I'm looking at you, Smoother. Now, just to quickly recap Group A, because we're here, why not? The problem with trying to recap Group A is that it's not really a particularly interesting group to look at, particularly when you see the teams that came out of this group. You saw Nip that came out of this group basically by virtue of beating OG, who are not convincing with this roster and probably need a roster move before they're going to look like a legitimate top 10 team in the world. I think OG are kind of similar to big. They're kind of hovering around that top 20. They're not bad. They're going to beat tier two opposition. They're going to beat some tier one opposition occasionally, but they're not good enough to regularly make playoffs at big events at the moment. And they need a roster swap to do so. And then obviously they beat liquid who are a dead team. We look at who came out on the upper side of the bracket. It was two dead teams. G2 are going to make roster swaps and they're currently playing with a stand-in. Vitality are about to make roster swaps. It just meant Group A was not particularly interesting, I think, from a narrative perspective. Obviously, the teams play good CS. G2 and Vitality are still good teams. Um, I still expect them to play good games in the semi-final and the finals. But it just made this group kind of dull to me because there were so many dead teams there was Astralis looking really underwhelming all of a sudden as a new team. You know, they beat Maus, who, like, this Maus roster is crap and needs to kind of be blown up as far as I'm concerned. And then, you know, lost to a dead team in the form of Liquid, got banged out on Nuke. So it was kind of disappointing to see Astralis look so good at Blast and then not follow it up at all here. And then that's it. Though. That's the only other team of interest that you would look at and say, I want to kind of follow them and see how they're doing. And they got banged out. You know, it was nice to see Nip, um, particularly Device, recover, uh, especially when you consider the dejection that he suffered at Blast. Like, that was really painful to watch personally, that interview. He looked so dejected. He looked so down in the dumps. So it's good to see Nip recover to some degree. However, if we take a little look at the what they did to get to the semifinals, again, Nip kind of their run was largely off the back of not playing too many great teams. I mean, they beat Astralis, but this Astralis were terrible at this event. 
They got beaten convincingly 2-0 by Vitality, a dead team. Admittedly a good team, but a dead team nonetheless. They only had to beat OG, and that was the closest series and you probably would have wanted against a team like OG. And then they, again, they beat a dead team in the form of Liquid, and they beat a godsend who are not quite ready to be a tier one amazing team yet they're a top 20 team they're on that sort of cusp of like bottom of tier one top of tier two type team but like nip had to play nobody good really to get to where they are and i expect them to get banged out by g2 i will preview the semi-finals and the grand final in another video i will do that in the next couple of days i hope you enjoyed this one guys take it easy let me know what else you want to see and uh love you all